I'm not a feminist, and it's not because I hate women. Although some will say that feminism is just about men and women being equal, we both know that in, it encapsulates a lot more than that. But today I wanted to hear from some male feminists that are going to try to convince me to come on over to their side. Today we're going to talk about is the Bible anti-women and is abortion always wrong? Let's dive in. This video is made possible by the Daily Disciple Club on Patreon. To support my mission of equipping people to follow Jesus daily, join Patreon today. Men and women are both equal under God and in value as human beings. In Genesis, you have a creation of both men and women that are made in God's we're image. We're not about so to quote both... the Bible in like some yeah. feminist Hold on, topic. but so, I mean, we well, can. We're operating in a country we... where there's a separation of church and back. state. You cannot use religion okay, as, as, as a motivation to make legislation. Women. Okay, so he doesn't like the Bible being used to draw lines for legislation. People often say, and he probably would agree with this, is that you don't legislate morality. But the truth is we do that. Laws draw moral lines all the time. And in legislating those moral laws, everyone operates from a standard. Now for him, he despises the standard of the Bible. He says, no, 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 we can't use that. We can't use that at all. There's a separation of church and state. But he has no problem holding to his own subjective morality. This echoes a fundamental lesson that we continue to learn that we would much prefer our own personal opinion over the word of God. The question is not whether the government will draw moral lines. The question is, is whose morality will they use? Yours or God's? If I hear one more person use religion as a reason to not give rights to people, I'm probably going to fucking explode. He says he can't stand it when people use the Bible to take away people's rights. Well, my question is, is where are you getting these rights? Where is your foundation for where these rights come from? Think about it for a second. In an atheistic, materialistic worldview, we are just evolved protoplasm over billions of years. We're just like stardust bumping into stardust. In that world, who would say that we have the right to do anything or we have any obligation for anything? There is no right or wrong. The idea of fundamental rights in that worldview makes no sense. Watch out for these buzzwords like human rights because what I've discovered is when you dig a little bit deeper you find out that they actually have no foundation for these rights that they're talking about and ultimately our rights come from God that he created us in his image and that that means that we have dignity and we have worth and that's that should be protected and ultimately those rights that God does give us are an act of his grace because ultimately we don't deserve anything before God but that's all out of his mercy towards us. People using their own personal ideologies as an excuse to implement legislation over other people's lives are simply just not okay with the fact that they can't control everything around them. Bro literally just described himself. He's using his own personal ideologies to impose his beliefs on other people. He says, no, this is the way things should be because this is what I believe. Meanwhile, this other guy is appealing to an outside standard, an objective standard, and he's like, you can't use that, you can't use that because it disagrees with my opinion. It's like, bro, what are you talking about, man? It's literally the difference between building your house on sinking sand or on a solid rock. As Christians, we have a firm foundation in which we can situate ourselves to say that this is God's standard. We appeal to the objective authority of God's word, which has been substantiated by unparalleled consistency, eyewitness accounts, fulfilled prophecies, and more. But no, 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 your opinion is probably much more valid. There's no wrong reason to get an abortion. So I'll just center the conversation around the very fact that, you know, we're a group of eight men, the optics of eight men in a room, talking about when women do and don't deserve to get an abortion is, it, it's a bad look. So yeah. like, this is how passive and detached men have become. We're scared of sitting in a room talking about something. Why? Because we're men. When Even when it comes to the, the, the idea of protecting our families and what that looks like, we're scared of talking about it because, no, no, we don't, we shouldn't have any say about this. It's like, seriously? Men are called to be the protectors of their families. And if it is truly a child in the womb, then why would a man not have a say on that? And more than that, honestly, he would have the response responsibility to stand up and do something. On a legislative level, I don't feel uh, confident enough to legislate when someone is and isn't allowed to get health care. Because yeah, right. that's what abortion is, it's health care. Yeah. I want you guys to watch out for this. In the Bible, it talks about how Satan is the author of confusion. One of the ways that that plays out is the distortion of terms. Health care, something we would immediately identify as good, as loving, as compassionate, is now equated hand in hand with taking a child's life. This is no accident. It's to bring about more confusion because Satan delights in distortion. Now, if I were talking to this fellow face to face, I would get down to the nuts and bolts real quick. What do you mean by healthcare? Medical professionals take an oath to do no harm. 
how could that exist in harmony with the dismemberment of a child? You don't need to look hard to find out what abortion looks like. It's about as grotesque as you can imagine. So why do people still call it healthcare and treat it like no big deal? In my mind, there's only two things you can conclude is that people are either ignorant of it and they don't want to con confront the truth or they do know what the truth is and they're just their heart is so hardened that it makes no difference. One of the paramount ideologies of, I guess, being a quote unquote male feminist is just the ability to mind your own business. Right. <laughs> um, just to be able to say that this is the wrong reason to have an abortion, you're already headed down the wrong path. Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. The last thing that God wants us to do is mind our own business when people, especially children, are suffering unjustly. To turn a blind eye when a child is suffering is the epitome of a weak man. And honestly, I think this is a testimony to how our culture treats men. We tell them to just mind their own business, that they have no mission, that they have no real purpose, that they're just the same as women, and that they just just can, you know, shut up and, and stay quiet and do their thing. But ultimately, like what God is inviting us into is to take our role as leader, as spiritual leaders, as protectors for our family. That is a high calling with great responsibility, but it's something that when we're in, that is where we find like the most fulfilling life when we are glorifying Christ in our role. He has told you, oh man, what is good? What does God require of you? But to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Do justice. That's the calling. To mind your own business is to be a coward. As men, we've become so passive that we pass the responsibility over to women. She can decide, she can handle it, it's none of my business. And that's why I think much of the fault of abortion lies at the feet of men for not leading as they should, for not taking responsibility. So being an anti-feminist, I, I look at this and I say, well, I am more religious as well. As am I. So I wanna say like, I'm more like pro-life, right? But if a woman decides that they wanna not give birth, it doesn't, it doesn't matter the reason, you know, maybe she's not, she's not wealthy enough. Maybe, you know, the father left her, you know, there's so many reasons. And then I also look at like just gun violence and how we're like birthing kids and we raise them and send it to school knowing that it, it can get killed. I don't know. I would feel like it's like not a safe, it's yeah, not the best world to be raising exactly, a child in. Exactly, exactly. An odd thing happened there. He declared himself to be more pro-life, but then he said, well, you know, but it, it, maybe she's not ready or maybe she doesn't have enough money or maybe the father left. All these kind of ch challenging situations. But if he is pro-life, like if he actually believes that it is a child in the womb, then what relevance does it have, like how wealthy the mother is, or maybe even how challenging the child's life will be? Ultimately, a challenging life is better than being murdered in the womb. Like legitimately, like we need to start talking that way. But then they say, oh, it's such a bad world out there. Like so many bad things happen. Do you really want to bring a child into that world? The truth is, the truth we need to understand here is that the child is already here. Like it's not that that decision maybe could have happened, you know, nine months prior, six months prior, three months prior. But like that decision has already been made. The child is here. They are living. They're created in the image of God. Now I realize it's pretty common these days to be scared about having kids, bring kids into this world for non-Christians. They say, oh, look, there's climate change, there's global warming, the economy is crashing. Um, there's things like that. And even for Christians themselves, they say, oh, like the world is so full of sin. And what, do I really want to bring a child into this world? For me, I'm not scared about bringing a, a child, my future child, into this world at all because I believe that God is sovereign. I believe that God, even amidst trials and tribulations in my child's life, that he will use them for his purposes and that I want to establish like a family legacy of glorifying God and even amidst the challenges and struggles and the darkness of our world that God wants to use us to bring light to the world and share his good news with folks. And I I want to multiply that. When you exterminate a child, that is doing oh, harm. But it's that not always not a child, care. right? So it's, it's, it's a discussion when it becomes a child or not. That's not a gray area. That's not a it line. It is actually scientifically proven. It is a, it is a separate so strain of DNA at wrong. conception. If you ask any doctor... But if you took that clump of cells out, would it survive? It's not. Ah, yes, the dependency argument. The argument that because you can take a child out of the womb at early stages and they won't be able to survive without the mother, that that means that that baby is not actually um, human or a child or living or worthy of life. But I want you to apply that same reasoning to two different situations. The first is newborn infants. If you've been around a newborn infant, you know that they are extremely needy. If you've had one yourself and you had to take care of it, you know 
know it, how challenging and how much, you know, care and, and they, they need. Because otherwise, if you leave them, and we've seen cases of this, you leave a child and they become malnourished and they experience great trauma and they could even die. Or think of an elderly person that's bedridden. They need their caretaker to help them use the washroom or take medication or get food. Like they rely on them for life, basically, to keep going. Because otherwise that caretaker doesn't come one day. Like that could have dramatic implications. Does that elderly person no longer deserve to live because they're dependent on their caretaker? Or does that caretaker have the decision, have the right to take that other elderly person's life because, hey, they're dependent on me? It right, is a life, but it is not a human. What is it, a squirrel? Now, if you're a Christian watching this, there's no doubt that you've probably heard someone accuse the Bible of being anti-woman or degrading women. So I made this quick video trying to address the topic and it got quite the backlash. You let me know what you think. The Bible is anti-woman. Really? Wow. Oh, okay. Um, according to your worldview, why are women valuable? Um, what do you, what do you mean? I mean, different people have different perspectives on what gives women value. There's some cults, they treat women like birthing machines. Their value is tied to how many kids they have. If you ask modern media and entertainment, women are valued based on how attractive and desirable they are. If you ask feminism, a woman's value is how successful she is in her career or how much money she makes. All those just sound wrong. I agree with you. And it's the Bible that says a woman's value is intrinsic because she is created in the image of God. Her value is not tied to her ability to have children or to be sexually attractive or her status. So there are two streams of thought in the comments. The first one was like, well, of course women are valuable. You really need to ask that question, obviously, because they're humans. But ultimately, I'm trying to get to the foundation of what we believe and why we believe what we believe. Like if you are in an atheistic, materialistic worldview, like we were talking about earlier, if you are space dust or if you are primordial ooze evolved over millions of years, who says that you have worth? Truly, right? If you, men are more powerful and it's just the survival of the fittest, then why don't they have the right to just do what they want? No, of course, but I'm like, of course, that's not true, but why? You be, you know that there's right and wrong. You know that that's not the way things should be, and that's why I'm like, hey, this is why I believe the Bible. This is why I believe the Bible is true. It says that we're both equal in the sight of God created in his image. And the second conversation that was happening in the comments was talking about places in the Bible where it was talking about wives submitting to their husbands. So I made a quick response video to answer it as concisely as I could. The Bible degrades women. Doesn't it say something about women needing to submit to men? Okay, what you're probably talking about is Ephesians 5. But it's important to know that it doesn't say that all women need to submit to all men. It says wives submit to your husbands. Okay, I, I didn't know that. And it also says that husbands should love their wives as Christ loved the church. What does that even mean? It means that just as Christ gave up his life for the church and loved them sacrificially, that's what husbands are called to. But obviously women are treated as less because they have to submit. No, but think of Jesus. When he went to the cross, he submitted himself to the Father. That didn't mean he was less than God the Father. No, they were equal. So what are you saying? Husbands and wives are equal in value, but God has given them different roles to display his glory and tell his story. After all this, have I been convinced to become a feminist? No. I'll stick with the Bible on this one, and I believe the Bible is the most pro-woman book ever. And so, uh, you know what? I'm happy with that. I don't need any extra labels. Christian is just fine with me. Thank you so much for watching this video, guys. If you got something from it, I'd love you to give it a like down below and subscribe because I put out new videos all the time and support my ministry on Patreon. It's the way I pay the bills around here and I can continue to make these videos. So thanks so much to everyone that's on there. And uh, yeah, I'll see you next time. God bless.